Welcome back to Inside City Hall. In recent weeks, we have seen indictments of police officers for alleged gun smuggling and ticket fixing, as well as three officers convicted of robbing a warehouse and seven narcotics investigators convicted of planting drugs on pe people. These high profile cases have sparked calls for more oversight of the NYPD. And joining us to sound off on this issue <coughs> are Richard Aborn of the Citizens Crime Commission, Brooklyn State Senator Eric Adams, Assemblyman Hakeem Jeffries, also of Brooklyn, and longtime police reporter Len Levitt, who writes for the website NYPD Confidential. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. And um, let me start with you, uh, Richard Aborn. Every 20 years, we have heard there's a major scandal and a major look at the department. So in the early 1970s, there was the Knapp Commission after Frank Serpico came forward with charges of widespread corruption. In the 1990s, we have the Mollen Commission looking at some other corruption cases. Well, we fast forward another 20 years and we've got a bunch of cases. Is it time for a major investigation? So regrettably, if you're gonna roll the tape backwards also, back to the 1890s, you would see the same pattern. So it's really since the 1890s, every 20 years, we've been having this problem. So I think it's time to adapt a solution which is permanent in nature, and that's why the Crime Commission has issued a report which, in fact, calls for permanent oversight of the NYPD. Do you know that if you were to combine the Chicago PD, the LAPD, and the, um, and the, and the um, uh, the, Chicago, the Chicago, Chicago, excuse me, L.A., Chicago, and Philadelphia, I'm sorry, you would still not have the NYPD in size. Mm. Yet each of those departments has independent, vigorous oversight, and that's what we need, and we need certain elements in that. <coughs> it needs to be independent, as I said, it needs to be transparent, it needs to have subpoena power, and it needs to be permanent. And, and part of being independent is to have a budget that's tied to the budget of the NYPD so that a subsequent mayor or city council cannot reduce the funding and make it ineffective. Uh, Senator, uh, former captain in the NYPD, take us inside the culture of the NYPD. Do they require some kind of outside force in order to keep everybody in line? I mean, do, do Yeah, and, and I think uh, Richard is correct. And what's more important, it's not a reflection on our police officers, and it's not a reflection on whoever's commissioner at a time, if you like or dislike a commissioner. That's not what this is about. It's about ensuring that the police department has necessary oversight, that they stay on target. It's a proper thing, proper thing to do. We need to know what our police department or police agency uh, is doing. And by having oversight that's outside the agency, it allows uh, true transparency that the police department is on target. Mm -hmm. And uh, Assemblyman, you have introduced a bill that would do some of that. Well, you know, I certainly remain convinced that the overwhelming majority of NYPD officers are innocent law-abiding citizens, uh, but there's clearly uh, a culture of corruption that's begun to fester like a cancer in the department and needs to be addressed. And I think that an important first step, we've called upon the mayor to do it, uh, is to empower an independent commission with subpoena power that can investigate the extent and scope of the corruption within the NYPD and then issue a report with strong recommendations that we in the legislature can then take and act in order to move toward an independent, permanent agency with oversight responsibility. In, in the case of, uh, of, of what you're proposing, does it have to be the mayor who calls for it? Could the governor or the state attorney general do the same thing? Well, based on past practice where Mayor Lindsay in 1970 appointed the Knapp Commission in the early 1990s, David Dinkins appointed the Marlin Commission, we think it would be appropriate as a first step, perhaps, for the mayor to recognize that there's a problem uh, and take steps to get the corruption within the NYPD under control. If the mayor makes the decision that it's not appropriate for him to take that step, I think we in the legislature are prepared to act, but the responsible thing to do, I believe, would be to empower a commission that can thoroughly investigate the nature of the corruption issue recommendations that we can take under consideration and then act as appropriately within the legislative body. And Len Levitt, you have uh, written at length, in great, at great length, about how the police commissioner, Ray Kelly, seems to have a Teflon coating, that he's one of the most popular public officials in the city, and um, you've suggested that that is gonna stand in the way of these efforts at reform. Well, I would say that um, Ray Kelly is unique in that he, has, he is probably the most powerful police commissioner the city has ever had. And one of the reasons he is so powerful is that the mayor has abdicated all responsibility and all civilian oversight over the police department. I noticed in your introduction you were talking about, does the police department need more oversight? Well, there is no oversight 
of the NYPD right now. If you think about it, there is not one agency, not one body uh, that has any control over the NYPD. There, w there is a body that in name uh, is, is supposed to supervise the NYPD called the Mayor's Commission to Combat Police Corruption. But what we saw with that commission was that when the past chairman requested documents from the police commissioner about allegations that the department was downgrading crimes, the police commissioner refused to turn over the documents, and the mayor took no position, and the chairman of the commission resigned because of that. You know, I think what's important um, is why th this police commissioner is so powerful. Uh, for many years, the police law enforcement community in the country wanted to push through some strong um, police tactics. They were unable to do so. 9-11 happened. Everything went out the window. The Handshoe Act went under attack. Other protections went under attack, and police powers increased. But the oversight didn't increase with it. And so one of the bills I'm introducing is that we will have similar to what we have on the federal level with where you have the CIA, the FBI, and other um, federal law enforcement agencies come and before the Intelligence Committee and have an overview. We need that here. We need to know why do we have officers in Europe. I shouldn't read in the paper um, as, a, as a chairman of Homeland Security that we could shoot down planes. What are we doing in mosques? Are we in churches? You can't have a police agency that is conducting co covert actions and no one in the legislative body uh, is aware of that. The police department does not have the authority to state that something is um, top secret. That's a federal classification. The police department can't do that, yet they have been hiding behind that. And I believe you need a legislative body that can go behind closed door, bring, bring in the commissioner, have, they sw have them sworn in with the threat of criminal prosecution and they re re reveal confidential information, but to find out what is our police department do doing. We should know what they're doing abroad, overseas, who's paying for it. Millions of dollars are used on the ring of steel, yet we don't know who the procurement contracts are. No one is watching our police department. When you were in uniform, when you were walking a beat, when you were part of this NYPD, uh, did you feel unsupervised? Do cops feel unsupervised? Like they've got to answer to one or two bosses and other than that they can make their own rules? I think that's an excellent question because the problems we're talking about is not really dealing with the everyday beat officer. It's dealing with the practices in the department. If you have an officer who basically feels as though he can stop uh, a person to stop questioning a frisk or plant drugs on anyone to deal with a quota or to um, lock up another person and say, I locked up another in. That's a culture of comfort in the police department, similar to when Abner Lewima was sodomized. Volpe had to feel he can do this without any form of recourse. What's needed in a department are those who are responsible for ensuring that officers are doing their jobs and those policies must come under re the review. So the officer on the street, the everyday police officer, the everyday lieutenant, he has a comfort that he's not going to receive that level of oversight. And that's why you're seeing what's taking place. As a Sergeant Benevolent Association stated, when a young girl was arrested for walking through the park and she spent three days in jail, a college student, he was stating that the system and the culture of quotas, the culture of everything goes, is really hurting the police department. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to talk some more with these gentlemen in just a minute. Right now, though, we're going to take a break. Later on, we're going to discuss the race for president with two political observers. And don't forget, you can now follow us on Twitter at Inside City Hall, where you can get the latest political news, a preview of each night's program, and links to guest segments. Stay with us.